Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm Ian Goh. I'm a lecturer in classics at Swansea University. And welcome, and thank you for joining me, to cook like a Roman poet. Here, I'm going to be doing two recipes um, from the poet Horace, from his satires. Uh, and um, I hope it is useful and instructional and enjoyable. This will eventually become part of the YouTube series, The Food of Roman Verse. Right. I'm going to share my screen um, right now. So I hope that's working. I'm currently multitasking. I'm engaging in making some, some flatbread, which we're going to use later. Okay. So thank you to the Swansea Science Festival for giving me the opportunity to do this. I am going to jump straight in now uh, with the oh, I'm going to jump straight in here with the with an extract which I hope you can see on your screen because of screen shared from Horace's satire 28 and here um, this is a description of a dish which features a moray eel uh, an eel stretched out in the dish amid swimming scampi it says here. And then thereupon the master says, this was caught pregnant since after spawning, it will deteriorate in the flesh. The sauce was mixed from the following, oil, which is the vinaphrin seller's first pressing, fish sauce from the juices of Spanish fish, five year old wine, but originating on this side of the sea while it has been heated, white pepper with vinegar, which through spoiling has soured the Methymnian grape. I first taught, says this person, to boil fresh green rocket and bitter elecampane in the sauce. Cotillus unwashed sea urchins as that which the seashell yields is better than fish brine. This recipe comes from a poem, which is a description of a banquet at the house of a gourmand named Nasidianus. And this recipe, um, is, is interesting for many reasons. Firstly, I'd like to point out that this, the source which I'm going to be making right now is translated from the Latin, um, jus, as you can see at the corner of this slide, the bottom corner of this slide. The word jus means source, and it gives us our English word juice, um, like um, jus, via French. However, in Latin, jus also means law or justice. Like you can see how it's turned into our English word justice. And so when it comes to precepts about food, when it comes to eating, you can assume that law is going to be part of it. And there is going to be, there is a lot of thinking about how um, food can be regulated and controlled. And this, the, this pun is very resonant um, in Latin poetry of, this, of the kind that we're looking at today. Now, I haven't got an eel, I'm afraid, but, um, or at least in total, but I have here from Seven and Y Smokery, some smoked eel, which I'm going to use for this dish. And to preserve this idea of, of the pregnant eel, I have, with me some, some um, caviar, uh, some herring roe as a caviar substitute, which is going into this dish. Now, this sauce is being mixed, and this is appropriate for the kind of poetry that this appears in, because the poetry is called satire, and satire is kind of a mixed genre. It contains multitudes. And so this sauce is very appropriate for, uh, to appear in satire. And, um, I'm going to put some of the components together right now. So, let's see. 
in a bowl, then I'm putting some olive oil. And um, I have some, some anchovies here, which are uh, to substitute for, for the, for the, um, the well, fish sauce as well. And I'll add some actual fish sauce as well, like so. The fish sauce that would have been used was was for was usually garum, um, and the best garum is is meant to be Spanish. Apparently, this is um, regular um, uh, Thai fish sauce, which is quite which is similar, if, if a little less pungent. Now, five this five year old wine. I previously heated some red some red wine. This red wine um, in in this pan. So I'm going to add that. And then I forgot to obtain some white pepper, so um, I've got some black pepper instead. And then vinegar. So I'm using red wine vinegar. Most of the most of the wine in antiquity was red. So essentially, this is kind of more dressing than a sauce even. Um, but what I will do now is um, put some rocket, and I couldn't find El Campane, um, uh, which is a bitter root. Um, and the Romans were very interested in, in mixing the sour, the sweet, and the bitter. So I have some chicory instead, some Belgian um, endive. And I'm going to um, put some more wine, uh, put some more oil in this pan. And just wilt the rocket um, and the chicory in here. Big handful of rocket. And really, this this dish is almost done. So, kind of. Um, Kind of a cheat cooking, I suppose. Okay. Now you may wonder, what's going on with this with this recipe? Why do we hear about it? So this poem is an account of a banquet held at this man's house. The master in this extract is um, this Nasidianus person. And um, he's, it sounds like he's a person of taste because his name starts with Nas, Naso, um, which, um, which gives us, the, which is the word for nose. So he's got a nose for, for, the, for the good life. The problem is that this is a lot of information about this dish. He's very proud of it. This, is, this recipe appears near the climax of the poem. What happens at this banquet is that uh, course after course is being presented, but immediately after this lecture, this mini lecture from, from, the, from the host, a tapestry collapses on the dish and on the table and no one gets to try the dish. Unlike me, who later on, I'm definitely gonna be eating this. And so what's happened here is that this is a reversal of fortune and um, the Sidianus can barely cope with this, with this um, catastrophe. And he does a bit of a recovery, but then all the people at the banquet, um, and they've been there since midday, apparently, um, they leave and he is cheated of, of his display of, of the wealth, of, of his wealth and um, um, good taste. So that's one thing to, to bear in mind. Nasidianus is a gourmand. This kind of, of open luxury is, is, is 
kind of frowned upon in ancient Rome. I might add a little bit of water to this so it doesn't stick. Now, there are further complications. This description of what happened at the banquet is being told to the poet Horace in this poem. What happened at the banquet is being described to him by his friend or associate, the comic poet Fondanius. And what is striking is that Horace has not been invited to this banquet. And he's a bit, he's feeling left out. And his FOMO um, extends to him trying to make sure he is still in the good graces of his patron Mycenas, who was invited to the banquet, who was um, Fondanius let slip um, at the banquet. What's more, Fundanius had been at the bank, Horace had only found out about this, this meal, this, this um, mega meal, when he had asked, he had tried to invite Fundanius to dinner at his house the day before. And so he really is feeling left out and uh, kind of, and, and Fundanius perhaps is embellishing the story to make Horace feel better. What is one, another noteworthy thing is that Nasidianus, the host, could be associated with Horace, could, could be seen to be similar to Horace because he was putting on a dinner, uh, whereas Horace had, had designs on putting on a dinner for Mycenas and his friends and the gang. And so this, this description, this poem is um, emblematic of the anxieties of the poet Horace, who is in a way getting his revenge, right? Because, because the, the, the people, the members of the attendees at the banquet, like a bit like you, I'm afraid, don't get to try the dish in question. So it's his revenge, but it's also him um, saying, I, I feel left out. And we are meant to look at this and wonder about Horace's own self-presentation and how much the Sidianus, ironically or otherwise, reflects that. So. Now, what I'm gonna do is take this off, take this off the heat, pour this sauce over it. It's dressing like sauce over it. And that's a, got a pungent smell. And now I'm going to add um, my scampi or crayfish tails. Yeah. Then a fillet of, of this, a couple of fillets of this smoked eel. this off and uh, and my my row to make it look as if I have um, been using a pregnant peel. You should bear in mind that the dish as described is really a meal of luxury and this is antithetical to ancient Roman values, to the Roman, how the Romans wanted themselves to be seen, as we're going to, um, as we are going to discover later on, um, in about in about 10, 15 minutes. So here, oh, you can't really see that. Here is essentially 
the finished the finished dish, and the 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 eel can warm through um, in this pan um, while we while I talk. Another thing I want to draw to your attention is in a, an earlier poem in the same book by Horace. These, these are poems of the end of the, this is a book of poems of the end of the triumvirate. And so this is about 30, um, 30 BC or thereabouts. And in an earlier poem in the same book, Satire 2.4, Horace um, is listening to a lecture given by someone who had himself attended a lecture by a chef um, at a kind of cooking school. And in this, in this poem, uh, we find a dizzying array of precepts about cookery, about Roman cookery and the right things to do. And so an extract of that is this, where the, 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 the note taker in the lecture says, it is worth one's while to master the nature of the two kinds of sauce. So this is the note taker saying what the chef teacher had said. And so instead of giving us both kinds of sauce, we only get the simple one. Sweet olive oil, full bodied unwatered wine, the fish brine, um, which are, you remember the fish sauce from earlier, none other than that which makes the tuna barrel from Byzantium smell. And then you combine this with chopped herbs, let it boil, sprinkle with saffron and let it stand. Finally, add some more different olive oil. Now there is a question here as to the relationship between these two kinds of sauce, between the two sauces, the one um, I just made and the one described here. If we go back to that earlier sauce, uh, then, then you see here that Nasidianus claims to have been the first. He first taught to boil rocket and this bitter root in the sauce. And Catillus, um, for his part, someone else, um, was the first to put sea urchins in, uh, kind of one-upping upping the ante, like with better than fish brine. Now, the idea of being the first inventor of this sauce, this is something that the Sidianus is proud of. But if we look at the second, at, at this, this earlier um, source, then again, we have um, a, a, an inventor or at least an expert who is saying something, things that are quite, quite um, in tandem with, the, with that other source. And so is it true that Nicidianus was the inventor of the source? Perhaps not. Um, a point is made by Fundanius in that poem 2.8 that these lectures which were delivered by the host were kind of off-putting. I hope you're not put off by my lecture here. Uh, but another aspect of these sources is that the cooking precepts in 2.4, the, the poem, the earlier poem, have been observed to be quite similar to um, the kind of literary production that um, is um, that Horace um, is striving for. In other words, Horace, by putting these in his poet, by putting these recipes in his poetry, is making a point about his own poetic production. Yeah? And part of this is the kind of simplicity of this source and the sparingness of it um, fits together with Horace's own poetic project in these poems. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, the that the, these recipes um, are linked with Roman identity. And one aspect of this is that the genre of poetry that Horace is writing here, the kind of poetry is very Roman. And so it is linked with our ideas of, of what a Roman should be eating and um, in opposition to perhaps what Greek people might have been eating. So that is um, 
that's my spiel about um, Horace um, satire 2, 4 and, and 2, 8. Um, and I have, I even brought some, brought along some saffron, which I can, which I might put in, put into this dish to amalgamate the two. Um, but I, I want to, I want to um, maybe a, a little, a short break for, for some questions, perhaps um, might be in order while I move to the second, the second set of recipes, which um, I want to, the second recipe, which I want to deal with today. So a, a brief break from the sound of my voice. So let me return with a. Do I know whether Edward Lear was inspired by this poem? In what sense, perhaps? Um, his talk of um, he he definitely had a classical education, and this poem was um, is is um, was would have been part of that for sure. Um, I mean, to um, satire two eight. So yes, I, I would I would suspect that um, Edward Lear, um, with his talk of runcible spoons, was um, was inspired by um, by poetry such as this. So now I want to turn to um, an earlier poem still from the mid 30s BC, from Horace's first collection of, of what are called satires or sometimes um, sermones, which means chats, discussions. Excellent. So the extract here is uh, features um, Horace now speaking in his own voice and he's describing a routine which he does um, which he claims to do and this um, extract says that he wanders wherever he pleases on his own he goes to the market I ask what price has been charged for greens and flour often in the evenings I stand around in, I stroll around the circus and forum, those haunts of trickery, loiter by the fortune tellers, and then I make my way home to a plate of minestrone with leeks and peas. My supper is served by three boys, he then goes on, and on a white slab stand two cups and a ladle, beside them a common cruet, a flask of oil and a saucer. All of them are campanian ware, and then he goes to bed. Firstly, to, to start at the end, um, perhaps, uh, the, the, the crockery that he uses is humble crockery, like cheap companion wear. And his, his servants are just three boys, and so he's not very extravagant in his, in his household. And fundamentally, we have this dish, well, I call it a dish, um, because it's or a recipe, it's not really, it's just three things um, leeks, peas, and what we call laganum. Now, this lagani catellum, catellum mean or catellus means a plate or a dish, yeah. So, it's a dish of this kind of flatbread which is laganum, which has been thought to give rise to our, our word, our, the, the word lasagna. Laganum is apparently a flatbread. So I have here um, some, after I've put some oil in this pan, I have here some flatbreads, which I have been making, making earlier. Yeah, 
which I'd make purely out of spelt flour and a bit of water. Um, very easy, and they crisp up in a, and you can crisp them up in a pan. Now it's often said, um, it's often said that that um, pasta only came to Italy with Marco Polo when he brought noodles back from his travels in China, from his life in China. That is a nice story, but there have been pasta-like things. There were pasta-like things in Italy, in ancient Italy and ancient Greece. Um, so that's not necessarily the case. This catillum, this Lagani catillum, is a kind of dish then, which sim is similar to a casserole, uh, because the casserole is named after the dish which contains it. However, these, this, three ingredient, this simple three ingredient dish yeah, um, is what I'm going to make for you now. Uh, I say make, um, assemble is more appropriate again. Uh, because we have here, I have here, I've been heating up some oil and I have some chopped leeks, which I'm just going to add to this to sweat off a bit. Now, while that is happening, we have to remember that Horace, in presenting this, this um, uh, meal, has an agenda. And this, um, this agenda of his constitutes his own, again, self-presentation. How he wants us to see him. How he wants us to read him. This is a very humble meal. There's no meat in it. And um, as a result, Horace is, is troping himself as a man of simple tastes. Moreover, he has been going around the forum and the circus, and he says he always does this, so this is his routine, but what he's doing is, is being free to roam around the city and so what this implies is that satire, this kind of poetry that Horace is writing, is city poetry. Horace doesn't produce the leeks and peas. He asks what price is being charged. He may be buying them. This is mercantile poetry. Horace is, is, is purchasing, not producing. He, is he wants us to think of him as the only thing he's producing is poetry. So he lives very simply, and the, the result is that he is living like a good Roman because he doesn't, he doesn't have need of anything else except this flatbread and, the, and these vegetables. And it's very good for a Roman to eat vegetables. Um, for instance, Roman heroes such as Romulus and Curius Dentatus, uh, a general, um, famously ate turnips. Uh, and Cato, um, Cato the Elder, who wrote a book about agriculture, finishes it with a long passage in praise of cabbage. So this is very, this is very um, Roman in its aspect. So. What I'm going to do is at the peas. Now I have the world's I have the world's largest the world's largest bag of peas here. So I'll just put some in here to step up. Get rid of that. And put the bag over here. And to show you there's no trickery at all, that's all there is in this pan. Peas, peas, um, leeks, 
and a little bit of olive oil. And I will add the flatbread in a little while. Now, this may seem quite boring to you. It, does, it certainly does to me. And so we might wonder about other things that we might add to it to jazz it up a little. One of those things is dairy products, such as butter or what I have here, some cheese. But it's an interesting fact that in Horace's poetry, in these, in these two books of satires, 18 poems in total, at least eight of them really concerned with eating, cheese never appears. Now, why might that be? Now, dairy products were less popular in, ancient, in the ancient world because they were hard to keep. They were hard to preserve, even if cheese is, is, is already pres um, preserved milk, so to speak. And part of the issue here is that cheese is seen not as part of the mercantile world that Horace claims to be inhabiting, but as part of the pastoral world of the countryside. So cheese is linked with uh, pastoral poetry and, and with shepherds and herdsmen from whom Horace is trying to dissociate himself. Moreover, cheese is seen as quite old. It's, it's a kind of, um, it's a throwback to the earliest days of Rome. And so it's seen as in Horace's writing and also in the writing of contemporaries such as Varro, it's seen as antiquated stuff. So Horace is a bit more, up, he's up to the minute. Right? He's much more trendy than that. And a third problem is of course that, um, that cheese just like seafood um, there, and it also as it happens, um, beef, cheese, beef, and seafood, these are all seen as Greek things. So in a Roman poetry, such as Horace's satires, such as Horace's satires, there, are, um, there is no cheese because that would be too Greek. Roman satire is the only kind of poetry which the Romans thought of themselves as having invented. They stole everything else from the Greeks. Now, it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of a, um, an interesting conundrum here because um, when we think of herdsmen um, and the composition of pastoral poetry, um, such as Virgil's Eclogues, and even the agricultural poem of Virgil, Virgil's Georgics, which is about, in the end, food production. Um, those poems, you might think, featuring herdsmen, have the herdsmen wandering around following their flocks. But the problem there is that they don't have the freedom to do whatever they want. They have to follow their flocks. They have to go where the flocks take them, where the herds take them. And therefore that's different from Horace who has the freedom to, to do his own routine. I'm now gonna add some of this flatbread to the casserole. The Romans may have used this as, as instead of cutlery because they did not have cutlery. So to scoop up, to scoop up some of this um, delicious, if simple, um, food. Um, additionally, um, we might think of putting, I mean, leeks already are an allium, but we might think of putting garlic in, in a, a modern version of this dish. Um, but of course, because garlic is so pungent, again, it's, it's not innocuous. Um, like Horace wants to be. Horace wants to keep a low profile, right? He's, he's saying here, I'm a very humble man. I, I live pleasantly. I live according to an Epicurean um, lifestyle. I don't have ostentatious displays of wealth, um, but I have my own 
my own routine. And what's more, just before this passage, Horace has said that he is not a politician on the make. Um, he, is, he is doing this, he's just wandering around the forum, he's not canvassing for votes. Um, he is not busy, 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 like his patron, Mycenas, who is the addressee of this poem. Which, mind you, comes five years or so before the, before the banquet poem uh, and, the, and the, the Cook's lecture that I treated earlier. So this is an earlier stage of his rapport with Mycenas. And he's saying, I am not trying to get into, my, into the regime's good graces. Mycenas, the patron, was Augustus's minister of culture, essentially, and, um, and a very wealthy man and a po patron of numerous poets, including Virgil and perhaps Propertius, as well as Horace. So before this um, starts to catch, I am, after all, going to add some parsley, some herbs to this. We're going to give it some, some actual taste, and I will eventually end up adding cheese to it, I suspect. Together with some bacon, um, some um, prosciutto, um, because at, in the end, bacon is seen as particularly Roman as well. Bacon um, and pig products um, in opposition to um, beef, for instance, and, and fish. Okay, so a good, honest Roman cooking. I'll take that, I'll turn the heat off there. One final point, though, is this. At this stage in Horace's poetic career and actual career, he has just gotten to know, he claims, Mycenaeus. He is at liberty to do whatever he likes with his life in the evening. But when it comes to, when it comes to the, um, the later poems, the second book of satires, Horace, it turns out, has been given a farm, the Sabine farm, by through the good graces of Mycenaeus. Mycenaeus has gifted him a, a property in the country. So this makes, um, this makes things a little awkward for Horace. So you can see why he is constantly reevaluating his relationship with Mycenaeus to the point when he is not invited to a banquet um, with structured seating, um, by the way, um, where Mycenaeus was present in satire 2.8. When it comes to that, you can see his, his mind whirring. Um, what, what's going on? Am I, still, am I still okay? Am I still in the in-group? Um, what's, what's happened? And at the same time, trying to remain nonchalant and not caring about what Mycenaeus or anyone else thinks. Okay, so th these are dramas of positionality in a sense, um, in terms of the presentation of the poet himself and thinking about his, his identity as a Roman and also as a writer of this kind of poetry, which is, as I've said, obsessed with food. So here is just an injunction to, to you to, to sign up, um, to subscribe to our, um, our YouTube channel for the department. And now I see there are some questions. Okay, ancient satirists, um, shall I stop sharing this? Oh. Let's see. I'm gonna stop sharing now in the, in the hope that you can, you can see more of me. Uh, do, the question is, do other ancient satirists write about sources? Yes, they do. Um, but and and they often they often write about them in relationship with uh, with this law pun. Um, there was a, in fact a law called the Lex Satura, which was perhaps an omnibus law with lots of different headings, um, and that's described as a jus. Um, the founder of the genre, Lucilius, um, wrote a poem attacking um, a man named Lupus, whose name is um, means either wolf or sea bass, and he describes lupus in 
uh, in a trial um, as being overwhelmed by source. But um, so that's the fish being overwhelmed by the source, but also the, the politician being done undone by the law. Okay. Um, is it customary in the Roman world to be served by three servant boys? Um, it, it is seen, it's not necessarily, and this does seem rather extravagant to the modern audience. I would say that it is, that it is um, uh, an, it actually an example of his humility. Um, hang on. So, where is this? Three, um, um, I'm, I'm consulting the commentary of my, my old PhD supervisor, Emily Gowers. Um, and as she says, um, three is a more modest number than it sounds. Um, it's fewer than, um, they're fewer than the five slaves who belong to another person, uh, a politician named Tilius. So by, co by comparison, this is um, a, small, a small household, okay? So yes, it does sound extravagant, but it is less so than it appears. Um, and what did Romans eat on their birthdays? Um, the, they, they would eat, well, let them eat cake. Um, they would eat honey cakes, um, and, and, um, but they would offer bloodless sacrifices. Um, so, so part of the birthday ritual was that you would offer a sacrifice to the birthday god, the birthday genius, uh, and and um, who is kind of an extension of your own soul. Um, and this is actually an important point with regard to the, the construction of time in the satire as well, um, because, because we saw Horace being free and easy with his time. It stretches, it, it elongates to like match his, match his narrative purposes. Um, whereas on, um, the celebration of birthdays is possible at this time because of the institution of the calendar. Uh, and yet um, the, on a birthday, they would offer bloodless sacrifices, which therefore means cake and, and libations of alcohol. So no meat. Any more questions? What would Horace's three slaves have eaten? Perhaps the same thing, and this would be, and this um, symbolizes the 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 humility of his lifestyle and the fact that even though he is their master, um, he is not he is not giving them scraps. Yeah, um, he talks about this. He talks about um, sharing with with servants or slaves um, in a in a later poem, um, two six sharing it sharing out a satire two six. He talks about sharing out the, the humble food equally with them. So yes, they would probably have eaten much the same thing. So yeah. Um, Um, that kind of concludes um, what I had to what I had to say. Uh, oh, more 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 questions. Sorry. Um, yes, would Horace and his servants have eaten at the same table? Uh, perhaps. Um, this is this is part of his this is part of his idea of 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 everyone um, sharing, um, which he is at pains to 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 tell us in the later poem. Were poems and poets the original social media? I'm getting. Uh, we could think of it like that, uh, but um, uh, if we if we think of them, if, if we think of Horace as an influencer, we do have to remember. I mean, who is he influencing? Not many people. Only the elite can can read um, at this at this time. Um, there is a there is also a, a question about how um, ephemeral or um, long-lasting, this kind of poetry, these chats are meant to be. Uh, so, I mean, whether, whether they were intended for us to be reading them even now. And the answer is, 
um, is, is complicated, as, as you might expect. Um, in particular, um, these poems are about Horace's anxieties of self-presentation vis-a-vis um, -vis the regime, um, the incoming um, regime which has ended the civil wars. Um, and um, in later poems, he, he adopts further this symposium context, the party um, banquet context um, to um, different forms of poetry. So yes, uh, I, and he makes a big show of being good at all these kinds of, of poetry. So in that sense, yes, they are perhaps um, the original social media. And uh, last question, perhaps, what are your favorite, what are your favorite parts of the poems? Oh, um, the, these are, these are great poems. Um, let's say, let's say the, let's say the references to food, uh, because that's, because that's been the theme of this, of, of this presentation, which, as I say, I hope you've enjoyed. Right, so as I say, um, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I should have had the, the, the URL ready. Oh, I do now. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, and also you can find it by searching for Swansea Classics. Um, thank you so much for watching um, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to stop recording now and end the session. <laughs>